Uh, is this on? No. It is? Yep. I, I think I have a, a three-part question, but I guess they're related, maybe, uh, for Ava. Uh, one thing that I was wondering, so what I was wondering was, at some point uh, you mentioned that, uh, I, I don't know exactly how, st how much you are emphasizing this, but that should there, there should be unitary subjective dynamics. I'm, trans I'm interpreting that as, uh, as unitary subjective experience. Is mm -hmm. that? Yes. And so my question is, why does it have to be unitary? Right. That's a very good question. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, uh, you, you, you have to do what, uh, the kind of thing that uh, Bjorn Merkel was emphasizing, and that is you have to, to have a unified, you have a lot of things that impinge on your sensory and, uh, and motor system all the time. You have to make, you have to have a lot of lateral inhibitions in order to make sure that the kind of, uh, that the kind of uh, relevant uh, picture or uh, image of the world or of the body is coherent. So I think that it is, that, so, so if you, you, you have to have, you, so I think that it is a byproduct of this kind of uh, mechanisms for creating, for creating coherence. To some extent, they can break down sometimes. And when they break down, sometimes we have pathologies. So I think that uh, because, it be, be, I mean, when you are sort of uh, uh, getting a, a sensory, in, a complex sensory input, and you have to integrate it, and you have to respond, and you have to integrate the response, your body, with the sensory response, and to make several loops of this kind of thing. If you have several competing kind of, uh, uh, competing kind of systems, it can lead you astray, I guess. And uh, so I think that the, the simplest solution for this is to have just one at a time. And and shut down everything else. Right, right. I mean, I think unitary makes sense, but at, at the same point, I don't know. Suppose there's some kind of genetic mutation that that leads to some schizophrenia-like with hallucinations, and, and but it also carries comes up with several other um, other changes that are that are beneficial. So I mean, so so in a sense, I guess what you're saying is that it it, it cannot be a solution that is viable in the long term because it's basically going to to be more disadvantageous than yes i would i would guess so i mean you do have uh, some horrible cases of uh, multiple personality uh, p uh, people or even schizo uh, or schizophrenic people uh, or uh, multi personality but when you have the multi personality which is uh, associated uh, with the, we had a poster here about that with the, uh, with the child abuse and things like that, what you have is also you have one personality and then a switch to another and then a switch to another. So at, every, at any point in time, you have one particular personality. Now you can have all kinds of conflicts in under pathological conditions, but they are pathological. And that suggests that this coherence is probably the best engineering uh, kind of solution to, to, to long-term adaptive uh, behavior. But, but perhaps we could all live in an, on an island and we all would have multiple personalities. So, so but anyway, that, I, I, I... Yeah, but they will be sequential. Sequential, I see. Yeah. Well, okay, maybe. All right. All right, I'm gonna ask the other questions after Dave asks, but otherwise it's unfair. Can, can I just add to that point? Um, it, it's um, regarding, uh, you know, the behavior of beehives and other things that have sometimes been uh, ascribed the, the name superorganisms. So we know that beehives have lots of adaptive uh, features on sort of the groupal level and you wonder whether they would have experiencing in as much as their uh, multi multitudinous behavior cohered. Well it's a good, it's a, it's a very good point and it, in fact it's very helpful. Because if you're thinking about the evolution of uh, multicellularity or about superorganisms, what you see is exactly this, that in order for something to be defined as a new individual, a new level of individuality, it has to be systematically, not just once or twice, a unit of selection. And for that to happen, you have to have a lot of policing mechanisms that 
and a lot of uh, policy mechanism and other mechanism that suppress the individual uh, selfish interests of the constituent parts. And I guess that this is also the case here, that you have to have a kind of selection process. So that's why in my list of what, what we need in the dynamics, one of the important things is selection. You will have to select, you, you, you will have to make sure that these conflicts are not there and are not hindering the functioning of the total, uh, of, of the total system. And this you see, in, uh, whenever you are looking really at any level of individuality, this is just what you see in multicellularity, in, uh, in chromosome evolution, if, uh, if the chromosomes evolve from, bits, uh, from uh, separate genes, you see it, and you see it in superorganisms. Well, actually, maybe you can just follow up quickly, given that how it's, the discussion is evolving, because I guess it's not the same thing, but also related is your, again, s sort of requirement that it be centralized and you know, with cephalization and whatnot, because again, this is one model that we know, but we can't envision something that is distributed, you know, inherently distributed. And, and why is that? Why wouldn't that be viable? Just because it's completely distributed? have to be solved, but the, bind the binding that it allows, which is crucial to the kind of, uh, uh, to, to, to our kind of argument, is, uh, I think, much enhanced uh, in, uh, in this kind of systems. Now, you do have systems with uh, distributed nerve nets, not only in the cnidarians, you have it in some of the hemichorodates, and it seems like uh, creatures have lost their brain. Uh, several times in evolution. I mean, the brain seem, may seem to us a wonderful idea, but it has been presumably lost. And I think experiencing was probably also lost, although we think that, you know, once it's there, that's it. I don't think so. So I, but, so I think you can live perfectly well. I think, I think the cnidaria are very successful organisms, but I don't think, from what I understand, that they have the kind of binding and the kind of body uh, environment self relationship that uh, we recognize as experiencing. Well, maybe someone can, can, can also point this out because I wasn't here for, for Wolf Singer's talk, but you know, the binding doesn't have to be in space, it could be in time. So I don't know, that was the, I think that was the title of his talk, so maybe someone can bring it up. But I mean, again, right? I mean, it yeah, yeah. could, well, could be time, not space. Yeah, but it's already within a space. You see, it, it isn't. Of course, but in order to, if, if you think about the cnidaria with its nerve net inside it, all like a fishersman, a big fishersman net inside an organism, yeah? and you have to talk with everything, everything with everything. I mean, you know, it's all, and you, we know that what happens there is you put an in, uh, an input, but, and it sort of travels all over the place. But Eva, that's exactly how our brain is, though. Huh? But that's how our brain is too, right? It's a big distributed mesh, way, right? It's also specialized and put together. Right, right, no, right. It's also important. So right. temporal, temporal synchronization is hugely important. With, I, I said you have to have this reentry, you have to have all this stuff. But you also have to have the spatial organization, the format, as, in, as uh, America puts it. I wanted to add something for Eva. And yet, if you look at the human and actually the mammal, what you find is that we have lateral specialization of the cortical areas. So in a way, we're going away from this essential centralization back towards specialization. I think that specialization and, uh, and cephalization are bound together in many ways. I mean, what you do is when you're looking at the, uh, at the vertebrate brain, you are seeing that there are, even in the f very simple vertebrates, in the very simple fish, you see that there is a motor region and there is a sensory region, and they are, to some extent, distinct. Nothing is completely distinct. So you have this kind of thing. And I'm interested in the very beginning. I mean, what happens when we sort of grow this fancy stuff? 
I mean, the, uh, the cortex is very, very interesting for us. But I think that, first of all, we have to understand what it means to feel the very simple feelings of hunger, of pain, you know, this kind of stuff, this very, very simple things. Afterwards, once we figure this out, and we didn't, we'll, we'll be able to think about other things. I think we should move on to the next question. We'll, we'll take one more from this side. Yeah. Uh, Felix, University of Montreal. My question is for Professor Eva Jablonka. Oh, I think you, pro you suggested that uh, our system has to be biological to, yeah. I think you suggested that the system needs to be biological in order to experience. And I'm wondering uh, how, uh, how is that you know that uh, our robot could never feel and just, and what is different in a biological system so that it can f experience, what is like the, the, yeah. the I don't, I didn't difference? say that the robot cannot experience. I don't think they do at the moment. All I, say, all I know is that the only creatures that I know that experience in this world are biological systems. This I know. I know that we experience and I know that other creatures experience. Whether or not, we can have, find the shortcuts in uh, artificial systems that we, will rec that we will say this system to experience this. I don't know. We didn't do it. I, I don't think we understand biological systems, but I think biological, we can learn a lot from biological systems. So we know that uh, in biological systems, this kind of experiencing is instantiated by, in this, specific way of doing involves A, B, C, D, E. I'm not saying that we have to copy it to robots. I don't know. But from what I understand, the robotics people are coming to this biological, uh, uh, to this biological meetings because they think uh, biology is good engineering and uh, there are things that one can learn from it. So for example, I know that uh, biological creatures are made out of cells and cells are like the most complicated little computers that you can imagine. So maybe, who knows, it's good for the uh, robotic people make a robot out of many, many, many millions of little computers, each of which is connected to other. I don't know, maybe this is a good idea. Maybe it's a good idea for them to have a lot, a lot of li little computers like that, which have limited small memories, simple memories, but can encode things at one level, and then there will be another level of encoding memories and another level of encoding memories. I don't know. I don't know how to build a robot. I'm not an engineer, and I'm not saying that it can't be done. I'm saying that the only thing that we know about is biological creatures do have it, we don't understand it, and we'd better make an effort to. That's all. Okay. So we'll take one from this side. Well, my question is for Professor Javanka as well. So if someone has a question for the whole panel, another speaker maybe? Well, okay. Um, well, when you, when you, the way you talk about um, felt needs and um, a system of, of value that would be necessary for uh, a unified, uh, for a, a complex model that uh, gives us a frame to, ver to ver really understand, you know, this the first stuff that comes up as you uh, as you say. Um, if you let me put it that way, uh, Damasio comes to mind when I. Uh, I mean. With his notion of uh, primordial feelings, I think it ties in very well with how you uh, talk about felt needs. Yeah. And also the system of value, he uses the term biolog biological value, as in how and how well or how bad it, it, it helps an organism for his, the maintaining of his homeostasis. And yeah, how does it uh, Yeah, first, for, first of all, uh, I have a debt to many, many people. We, I mean, we have a debt to many people. Damaso is one of them. And another person that was not mentioned here is Denton. I don't know if you know Denton, Derek Denton. He's an uh, Australian physiologist who has done uh, a lot of work on uh, the physiology of thirst. And he also is talking about something that he called the primordial emotion, uh, the primordial, primordial emotions or primordial feelings, which are the, ver the homeostatic feelings. He wrote a book in, in uh, 2006 about it, which is quite interesting. And he's talking about this kind of systems. The point is that uh, th these are very good things, and he has a lot of insights. In he's also talking to some extent, he's the counterpart of, Bjerk, uh, of Bjorn uh, Merker. Yeah, Merker is talking about the perceptual system. Uh, there, uh, Denton is talking about the uh, homeostatic system and the, and the value system that, that are associated with the compelling feelings of 
hunger of uh, you know, the need for salt and the need for th thirst once they are land animals and so on. So, so that would so be the kind of value system you think we should look for. Yes, I th now, but I, I think that again, both uh, uh, both uh, Denton and uh, to some extent Mercury, although Mercury is uh, much more uh, careful about this, are talking about uh, vertebrates. And I am not sure that uh, we have to be vertebrate focused. I mean, we understand vertebrates and we can justify and uh, substantiate at the uh, uh, neurological level much better our claims about these things when we're talking about them. But I wanted to present an argument which is much more general, and that's why we, we chose this uh, uh, unlimited associative learning, which is not specific to vertebrates. And if it is, it is an empirical claim that we have to, uh, to uh, I mean, one has to, uh, to, uh, to, to prove it. I think it is not specific to vertebrates. And my first picture here was of trilobites with their big eyes and uh, their seemingly complex behavior and also seemingly big body, which they had to move and coordinate and so on and so forth. And I'm not sure that they didn't have some primordial consciousness too, although they're not here to tell us. Well, anyway, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Gualtiero Piccinini. Um, I'm Eric from UQAM. You, you brought up three different kinds of zombies. The first being uh, exact physical replicate, the second being functional replicate. And the third is what I was wondering about. I have two questions. Um, the third was that it, it would be identical in biologically adaptive functions. So um, you mentioned, for instance, that uh, taking heroin is not biologically adaptive, so it would not. I, I wonder. Is that really, first of all, a good example? And is it even possible to find an example where a human would do an action that could not be somehow, somewhere justified as biologically adaptive? Um, and my second question is also, uh, why, why did you bring it up? Because it seems to me it didn't come back later. And I, I was wondering if you wanted to use it to justify um, a part of your argument. Yes, thanks. Um, Okay, yeah, heroin was just used for her illustration. I didn't mean to suggest that uh, that it's an it's an accurate <clears throat> description of heroin addiction with respect to adapted value. In fact, you know, I suspect that our disp the disposition to be addicted to drugs is just it is actually a byproduct of an adaptively valuable trait, which is to be rewarded by certain kinds of right. stimuli. Um, but so I just use it as a kind of illustration. And um, why did I bring up this kind of zombie? Um, because um, one reaction that I've had to this paper is, oh, but then you're just going towards property dualism or something like that, okay? Because uh, uh, it's a natural, uh, it seems to be a natural reaction when people hear this uh, hypothesis that consciousness is a span, is a span, or it's a byproduct or an accident to um, associate it with property dualism or epiphenomenalism. Um, and I wanted to stress that, uh, that there's no entailment from this hypothesis towards property dualism. So the, um, the third type of zombie is, um, is inserted here in the dialectic to try to inoculate the audience against that Temptation, you know, the temptation to infer that, oh, okay, we're discussing this hypothesis consciousness spandrel, so this guy must be a dualist, or we're going towards dualism. No. Um, it's perfectly consistent with physicalism that consciousness is, is um, a, a byproduct. Um, it, so you can see this also, in a way, by analogy with um, uh, with the with the second kind of zombie, namely the functional duplicate. So the functional duplicate is supposed to behave exactly the way we behave, but it's not physically identical. So there, may, there are other kinds of physical effects other than behavior, and it's not clear exactly where the dividing line is between behavior and other physical effects. So that's a whole other can of worms that we would have to open. But assuming that we can draw the line, um, so we, you know, we put the zombie in a scanner, 
Oh, it doesn't even have a brain. There is a digital computer in there, or whatever, right? So you can physically detect that it's different, um, but they're supposed to behave the same. In this case, um, there's all, there may be also a behavioral difference, right? In the case of the third type of zombie, so they don't, they're not, they're not, uh, they have no experience in the sense of phenomenal experience or feeling. Um, but, you know, for the most part, they behave like we do. But maybe there are like a few areas of behavior where they behave a little bit differently. Because that's where consciousness, you know, phenomenal consciousness actually is having an effect. It's just an effect that was not selected for. That, that would be the idea. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Diego Mendoza from McGill University. Uh, so, I, <clears throat> I heard from, from Dr. Massiver's uh, talk that uh, you're trying to you're you're trying to say that the one of the key elements in in the evolution of consciousness may have been the interaction of this you know motor space with with the sensory space and and the need to to extend uh, behaviors uh, etc. Um, and that this evolved at some point uh, in in lineages uh, and and then I heard from Dr. Jablonka that um, that it's uh, I mean, another proposition that, that uh, the evolution of consciousness may be related to the need to, to generate an unlimited number of associations between things, and, and, and that leads to this unification of, of information processing, etc., which itself may have evolved at some other point. Uh, I don't know. So m my question is, is there a way, is there a way to, to put those two things together and and come up with something that makes sense, or or are they completely um, are competing hypotheses? Well, I I don't think they're competing. Uh, uh, something uh, Shimon Edelman said in, during his talk is that it's wrong to think of consciousness that there are consciousnesses, and, and I think that's uh, applicable here. That um, consciousness is a very complicated. Thing and uh, there's phenomenality. Um, there's uh, this 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 experiencing that uh, uh, Ava's getting at, which I, th I think is kind of in there. Um, and I think that uh, deliberation over multiple futures is uh, something else, um, and it's something that. Uh, can can um, live alongside or 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 be part of or, or phenomenality is part of it. Um, I don't think that um, all animals that have phenomenality have the ability to deli to deliberate over multiple futures. Um, so I guess I would see this as sort of a more advanced feature of certain kinds of uh, of animals uh, that have consciousness and that. Um, um, that uh, the kind that Ava's talking about is kind of a more primordial base on which that stuff is built, but she can give you her answer. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it's a big question because in evolutionary biology, like if you're thinking about life, there will be a huge gray area in the, chem in the uh, ancient world where you will ask yourself, is it alive, isn't it alive? You know, it's very, very difficult. And I think it's the same here. And one of the questions that, for example, we asked ourselves, was uh, there is, uh, as I told you, I don't, we, because we think that cephalization is a very, very important aspect because it allows you all this more sophisticated binding and glo global kind of sensory motor uh, feedback and, and so on and so forth. So we wondered a lot about the cnidaria, the medusa, yeah, and things. Now, among the medusa, you have uh, one, uh, one group called the cubozoa. The cubozoa are terrible creatures. They are terrible because they, have, they are the most poisonous creatures you can imagine. I mean, they just touch you and you die. But anyway, but one of the great things about these cubozoans is that they have, uh, some of them have uh, clusters of eyes. And uh, some of them have 24 eyes in clusters of six. Now, these eyes are very sophisticated, very sophisticated. And they can see a lot, and they can behave in a very complicated manner based on visual input. Now. Of, and there are little ganglia that subserve each of these clusters of eyes. There is no central system. So we were asking ourselves, do they have some kind of phenomenological consciousness in the visual modality alone? Is it possible 
for example, to say that the creature has consciousness in a particular modality only, and only in, in, for example, only in the visual modality. I think that it is obvious to us that as creatures sort of uh, become, start hearing and uh, evolving all kinds of uh, sensory mod modalities, their consciousness and their, phenomen uh, their phenomenal world grows with them. But it is a question that, you know, it's the, the, there will be a lot of uh, uh, cases to which I will not be able to answer. I will say, re I really don't know. And I think that part of the reason that we are in such a big ignorant state is that, the, the, that we don't have a good model. If we had something like the chemotol, like this uh, model that Gandhi invented for the minimal life, if we had something like that, it would be a wonderful guide, but we don't. And I think that a huge effort has to be made in order to create something like that. Thank you. Um, Pascal Hindo from CAM. My question is to Eva Jablanka. Uh, you said um, an evolutionary transition approach to experiencing cannot begin with an attempt to identify NCCs. Uh, I take this to mean that NCCs are not. The I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you repeat who the question is for? Uh, it's for Eva Jablanka. So, um, so you said it cannot begin with an attempt to identify NCCs. I take it to to be that these creatures, the, the primitive creatures, aren't around, so we can test them for that. But um, I think that the whole approach needs to start with NCCs, as all the criteria you listed, like um, integration and all, all these criteria, are criteria that have been obtained or are best grounded in NCCs. So I'm thinking of instead of trying to go starting from scratch and trying to look where consciousness or um, phenomenality appeared, why not try to go backwards? Why not try to and use the, sim the simplest organisms that are still around? Right. I, look, I think all the NCCs that we have learned about are from mammals. You are looking at all the people at Cochin Creek and, uh, and uh, Edelman and, Dama and Tononi. All of them are working on, uh, there's very little work on birds. There's very little work on cephalopods. It's only beginning. We have nothing at all about other invertebrates in this, uh, fr from this point of view. So, and, and, and starting with the mammalian NCCs is very, very problematic because here you have a highly evolved brain with a lot of association and dissociations that are in place. So you have, for example, things like blind sight. I heard about blind sight all the time. And you know, blind sight is a great thing that here you can, you can have all kinds of uh, mo uh, 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 behavior without, uh, without experiencing. Yes, you, because you know, you br you, you, th this doesn't mean that it evolved like that. We didn't, uh, I don't think that uh, creatures who see evolved from blind, from blind sight creatures, right? Blind sight is a pathology. Of a, in, in, a, in, a, in a highly integrated and highly specialized system which, which has broken down, right? This is not how it evolved. Yes, of course, experiencing evolved from some non-experiencing creatures, but not like blind sight. It's a completely different type of non-conscious be, uh, being a non-conscious organization. So, we are, so I, I think that we're, if we're starting with the mammalian NCCs, we can be, we, we can be very misled. So first of all, so it's very good that uh, uh, McGuire and, uh, and Merker and people like that are at long last looking at the very simple uh, vertebrates that we have and trying to figure out what's going on in their brains. And it's very good that people are beginning to look at cephalopods. And I would think that it would be very good if people would, uh, would go into, into other invertebrates, for example, uh, for example uh, all kinds of uh, uh, crabs and... Uh, Insects? And crabs, yeah, and other, and other creatures to figure out what's going on in their brains. What are their learning abilities? Do they have re-entry? For example, in the bee, from what I understand, there are re-entry connections in the mushroom bodies. Yes. Very good. I mean, we need this kind of things, yes. But what I'm saying is, you know, if, this, if your starting point is the mammalian NCCs, and this is, was, is what I was uh, talking about, this is not good. Thank you. Hi, Anna from University of British Columbia. My question is also for Eva. Uh, I, at the end of your talk, you say, you ask, do Aplicius have consciousness? Probably not, but if we build a dynamic system that implements this, uh, this description that I presented to you guys and this 
dynamic system will behave like an aplysia, you would be convinced that the aplysia has consciousness. That's what I kind of intuited from what you said. So, so that, that tells me that you would be uh, satisfied with kind of a Turing test for the aplysia. If the <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good way of putting it. I mean, is there a Turing test for, uh, for experiment, uh, experiencing? So, you know, it's, I, I'm, I'm not, what I'm saying is, if we, am, if, if we have, a mo, you know, we have this basic, very simple model of minimal life, and we say, well, it's a good model, because it really satisfies all our list of uh, criteria for life, if, and for, including death, by the way. So, it's very good. And when we see something like that, like we'll be on another planet or if we find something in some, in some vents uh, in the ocean and we'll find this kind of thing, we'll say this is already alive. Now, I don't think it's terribly important if we say it's alive, it's 80% alive, almost alive or something like that. But I, I don't really know how to answer the question on aplysia at this moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that if I will have a good model, I will be 100% sure ever. But I will be in a better position. This is what I meant. <laughs> and maybe if we will have a model like this, this will be our tu kind of Turing test for experiencing, <coughs> just as we have a kind of Turing test for living. Not really Turing test, but <laughs> Gandhi test. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, OK, uh, Burton Vory is at Athabasca University. And this question is, uh, first off, for uh, Eva, but also for the rest of the panel. So there are two parts to it. Uh, the, uh, in your presentation, you suggested that with each transition, sort of the culminating point of the transition was the emergent of a new telos. Uh, so with life, uh, survival, with experiencing, uh, motivated action, and so forth. Uh, so the first part of the question for the whole panel is uh, to comment on this idea. And the second question is, uh, do you think that prior to the emergence of life, there was no telos? Or do even electrons have some sort of, some sort of goal? Uh, I think that they don't have a goal. I don't see, uh, for me, uh, a goal is defined in terms of a system. Uh, it's a system property, which is, uh, I don't, you know, I can understand what a goal is for a biological system, for a psychological system, for a design system of some kind. I don't think the, uh, the, the word goal as I use it, just like the word function, has any meaning in a non-biological uh, non self. I based uh, the, three tr the three big teleological transitions will not be a surprise to most of you, on Aristotle's The Anima. Aristotle is my favorite philosopher, and The Anima is my favorite book. And uh, he suggested that there were three great teleological, uh, he didn't call them transition, of course, but levels of what he called the soul. For him, the soul was a dynamic principle of organization. The first one was life, the second one was sensation and motivation, and the third one was rationality. And I think he got it right at this level. This is one way of carving the biological world. There are many ways of carving it. I, want, I chose this because I think that the experiencing problem belongs to this category of teleological systems that emerged at some point. So, Except that Aristotle also thought that everything had goals, right? But even beyond living systems. And um, so I'm just going to take this opportunity to agree with Eva and say this is a place where both Eva and I disagree with Aristotle um, because um, you know post Renaissance uh, the, or, um, the origin of modern science we rejected teleology at least from the non non biological world um, and and in in a way we changed the meaning of teleology a little bit in doing so along the lines of what she's saying. So, whereas for Aristotle, teleology is just inherent in everything. Everything just has a telos, and we can maybe uh, infer it from the behavior of the thing, what the telos is. So, heavy things has, have as the goal to go downward, 
Uh, why? Well, you know, drop them. Where are they going? They're going down. So that's their goal. Well, now we don't see it that way anymore. Um, and so what we now mean by a goal has to be something a little bit maybe weaker, a little bit um, uh, more dependent on what? On some systems property. So the way I see it is that uh, a, something that deserves to be called a goal is um, a kind of special property uh, that only certain systems have and uh, the presence of which is necessary for the system to continue to exist. So, you know, survival and reproduction would be um, things that deserve to be, states that deserve to be called goals because without them, living systems cease to exist. So um, you need to be able to die for you to have goals. Uh, well, for example, then, uh, would uh, Damasio's uh, idea of maintaining homeostasis yeah. constitute a goal? Yeah, sure, sure. But that's not a goal of consciousness, that's a goal of life. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, homeostasis is something that the bacteria is uh, maintaining. I mean, homeostasis is a basic, uh, you, you know, you have to, to, to have certain level of uh, ions in you and so on and so forth. So you all, there are lots of uh, co complicated systems. It's not a sp specifically a, a property of, uh, 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 of experiencing systems. It is one of the, uh, in order to keep homeostasis in a very complicated body and so on, in some cases you need it. For example, I think the Cnidaria is keeping homeostasis very nice, thank you very much, and it does, and I I'm not sure it's experiences. I mean, my hunch is it doesn't, but I may be wrong about that. Does anybody else feel like commenting? Uh, I want to ask a question again to uh, Professor Eva Jablonka. So, uh, <laughs> you're, you're quite popular today. Um, it's about, uh, so I'll tell you how I understood your argument. Maybe I'm wrong, so tell me if I'm wrong. But I understood that instead of looking for neural correlates of consciousness uh, by starting with what we know about humans, you find, you're trying to find, uh, that's not all you stated, but that's what I understand. You try to find some neural correlates of consciousness in animals, and you, you assume that this, those are different than those of humans, which is okay. But, uh, then you just assume some neural correlates of consciousness in animals, and then you look for them in animals, and you find them, and then you, you could confirm that they are uh, conscious, but this argument is circular, so it, it just doesn't work logically. Maybe, maybe I didn't understand it w well. And, I, and there's another problem that, that follows from it, is that um, uh, from, from this argument, you, uh, you conclude that you know that animals are conscious uh, but actually you don't know it because you assume it, so you believe that they are conscious. And uh, you, you, you say also that, uh, that uh, we don't know if, uh, if uh, computers or robots uh, some, uh, someday will be conscious, but I think uh, it's the same problem. It's, uh, we, we just assume some neural correlates of consciousness or robotic correlates of consciousness, or I don't know, and then we find it or not, and then we assume or not, uh, we confirm some, uh, some impressions from that. So. Yes, first of all, I'm not looking for neural correlates of consciousness in animals. I started from something else. I started from a complexity threshold criterion, which is much less demanding in many ways. In the same way that you say hered unlimited heredity, for example. Unlimited heredity is not describing life to you. All it's saying to you is if you have it, then you have creatures that are alive and the if you have this type of uh, uh, property, like unlimited heredity, this presupposes a, a, a supporting organization of a certain kind. In the case of unlimited heredity, an autopoietic system like a cell, like Gantis Chemoton, something more complicated than that, in fact. Anyway, so what we started with, we, we, it, when we started uh, thinking about it, we, we tried to look at mol molecules and at neural uh, processes in the brain and neural anatomy. Nothing helped. I mean, it was, uh, I mean, we were co at complete loss. And then we thought, well, maybe it will, we will find something at the behavioral level that will be a good indicator. So we're not looking for a correlate. We're looking at something that will tell us, if you have this, what, if, if, if there is this property there, then this property entails other things. Now, I could tell you, for example, if I was uh, not serious, 
that uh, if you have a creature that talks English, sits in a conference, and so on, this is a good indicator that the creature is conscious. Now, of course, I don't want a, cr a criterion like this because it is a, a rather uh, uh, not very informative for our purpose criterion. So we were trying to find the criterion which is, as, on the one hand, as minimalistic as possible, and on the other hand, as informative as possible, right? This is, this is what a good complexity threshold is. We came up with this idea of unlimited associative learning, and we tried to work out through the consequences of what does it mean to have something like that, this kind of ability. What does, and, and, we, and we were very, and we, and, and we argue that in order to have this property, you have to have a lot of very interesting supporting system, a very interesting supporting system for that, such as a creature, multicellular creature, cephalized with, all, with a lot of binding between within modalities and be, within a modality and between modalities with certain memory systems that have to be in place, but not you, and, and so on and so forth. You, you, just, you only talk about behaviors and uh, neural uh, events, so I don't see, uh, even if you talk about complicity threshold and you name it with an abstract name, it's still behaviors. Your criterion are behavioral and neural. You see, you, you I, see neural I, events, you see behavioral events, and then you, you say from those events, I can conclude that there's a complexity threshold that is sufficient, and that just will uh, permit uh, consciousness to, to appearance. I, I'm, what I'm so saying is if you, have, if you have this behavior, then you have to have this type of nervous system. If you have this yeah. type of nervous system, you also have to have this type of hormonal system. If you have this type yeah. of hormonal system, you have, I didn't go through yeah, all but this it's the, thing. It's right? the same problem, so you make a step between a, a third person perspective when you observe some, uh, some physical events, you make a step between that and first person perspective. So you, you make this conceptual stake, a step, which is uh, which is uh, it's false. It's like uh, it's illogical. I, I, you cannot you cannot assume for, from what you observe that the person feels. I, you I can not, say that there's that. I you, think that if you try and figure out what is going on in a creature that is able to to learn associatively in this way, this creature, what is going on, the kind of sensory motor integration that is going and body integration and feedbacks between it, if. That, that are of course private and, and uh, global and many, many, many other things, they, uh, uh, they seem to, uh, to instantiate the kind of properties that people in the philosophical literature are listing as properties of experiencing. So we are saying, look, I cannot prove to you that the creature uh, uh, that the creature uh, that the creature experiences in the same way that I can't prove to you that the creature lives. The chemoton of Ganti lives. I, I think it lives because it fulfills this criteria. I'm saying the creature is experiencing because it fulfills this criteria. I'm not in the position of Ganti. I'm not saying we are there. But I'm saying that through this kind of, uh, of approach, we can advance a little bit. We can make a little bit of progress. That's all. OK, thank you. Hi, uh, Yassine, Université de Montréal. Um, I'm really sorry of the, for the rest of the panel because the question is also for uh, Professor Jablinka. Um, I was wondering why uh, it is uh, um, unlimited um, uh, how you, um, uh, associative learning. Why associative learning? Only associative learning. Why it's not just learning uh, in general? Because. Uh, what is learning in general? I mean, uh, in addition, to associative learning is a very, very basic form of learning in the living world. In addition to associative learning, you have habituation and sensitization and their modulations. Now, uh, uh, habituation, sensitization, and their modulations are based on pre-existing reflex, uh, uh, reflex uh, systems. And they are very limited. So what you can learn, you cannot associate different things and bind them. So you don't have the kind of organization that we sort of, you know, it's, you sort of um, modulate one reflex, you modulate another reflex, but you don't sort of really create, a, 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 you cannot create with this system an integrated uh, a image of, of a world or of, or of, a, of, of a, or, or a body. So that's why we thought that uh, learning, uh, that this non-associative learning 
I mean, it's very important because it, a, a lot of the mechanisms, the molecular mechanisms were recruited afterwards for associative learning and so on. But we don't think that this type of learning are sufficient to, as a basis for, uh, for I, I, we thought that we need something slightly more complicated. Associative learning is all over the place. You find it in, in, in many, many invertebrate species. Not every species, of course. But even been. habituation, you find it in every... I mean, a newborn, uh, the first image who comes to his eyes, he has to... Um, he's not doing um, associative learning. I'm he's talking about evolution. Okay. Okay? I'm not talking about ontogeny. I mean, in ontogeny, as I said, the things are coupled evolutionarily. Of course, when you... Uh, when, uh, an organism comes to the world, I mean, the things that he, uh, he or she sees are learnable, but, the, but there are already phenomenal experiences there. There's no question about okay. it. I was talking about an evolutionary, from an evolu about an evolutionary coupling. Okay, thank you. Do we have time for one more question? Uh, Pietro Zanider, University of Lausanne, Switzerland. I have a question for Professor Piccinini. Actually, it's more a point uh, and I will ask for a, a reply from you. Uh, I have a problem with your argument from epiphenomenalism uh, and the way it is structured. Basically, the point was that point one, epiphenomenalism says that consciousness is causally inert. Point two, causally inert properties cannot select, be selected for. Point three, therefore, consciousness is either a spandrel or an evolutionary accident. And I think it's, it's a false argument in the sense that if you adopt supervenience, you can say that uh, the physical properties which are the super super supervenience base of epiphenomenal properties are causal. So the physical base is, is causal. Therefore, physical properties do have effects on which natural selection can operate. Physical properties, therefore, can be selected for, and of course, the epiphenomenal properties, by definition, come with the supervenience base, and therefore, they are they are selected, even though in in, in, in sort of indirect way, with the physical basis of supervenience. So it doesn't seem to me that I mean it seems to me that actually it is compatible with epiphenomenalism. Um, your, your point. Ah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, this is uh, supervenience is a, a little bit of a tricky um, notion, but um, however you want to look at it, um, if you are right, then you have refuted epiphenomenalism because epiphenomenalism, by definition, says that uh, consciousness or qualia or whatever you want to call it is in is either inert in general, causally inert, or at least physically inert. That that's the that's what epiphenomenalism is. It says it may be caused by um, physical properties, but it has no effects of its own. Right. But I don't see why that is. Well, we can talk about that later. But it, well, it's just what the view says, and it's it's uh, it's very you know it's counterintuitive. It's unappealing in many ways, but that's that's the view, and it does have certain. Um, advantages because it al allows consciousness to be something different from physical properties without interfering with uh, um, assumptions that are commonly thought to be plausible such that the causal closure of the physical, meaning that every physical effect has a physical cause, um, so um, I think it's probably the best thing to say is, according to epiphenomenalism, conscious properties or experiences do not supervene on physical properties. What about the placebo effect? What about the placebo effect? Where, uh, in some cases, some people believe that something will help them, and there's been nothing physical which has occurred. So uh, presumably, it's something that their mind is doing. Is this? Is this an, an example of a uh, conscious uh, state having physical effects? And that depends on whether the placebo effect is due to the conscious experience or to some non-conscious correlate of the, of the conscious experience. And 
Of course, that's the whole question to begin, you know, to, that we're starting with. So it could be that the placebo effect, the, you know, the effect itself is due to something that may well be unconscious or doesn't require the conscious feel that associate, we, asso we may associate with the belief or the, um, or whatever the experience is. So, yeah. Thank you.